This is an intensive care ward for newborns. Here, one particular group exists in a netherworld between life and death. These are babies who are born so prematurely that their survival stretches modern medicine to the limit. A handful may go on to become the miracle babies of magazine spreads and newspaper features. But the reality is that most will never see the outside world. And with each passing, the question grows. Is it worth trying to keep these babies alive? Simone has just been born in extreme prematurity. Babies like this, born four months early, don't last long without medical intervention. The Birmingham Women's Hospital is one of the few in the country capable of resuscitating extremely premature babies and keeping them alive. Simone now requires a respirator to breathe. She needs infusions to bolster her blood pressure and to promote blood clotting. Her immune system is only partly developed, so drugs are pumped in to fight off infection. Um, at the moment, she seems in reasonable condition. Her skin doesn't look very good and she's quite bruised, but she's not needing a lot of support from the breathing machine at the moment, and at the moment, her blood pressure's okay. Simone balances on the very edge of life. If she'd arrived a week earlier, she'd have been classified as a miscarriage and left to die. But Simone was born at 23 weeks, the earliest point in her fetal development, when doctors now believe that resuscitation is worth the effort. Her odds are not good. Only nine out of a hundred babies born at this stage will survive. And of those nine, only one will reach adulthood without disability. Simone's now stable, but she has a long way to go. The fact that she's so premature is really against her. We sometimes find with these very early babies that they look all right for the first hours or days, but unfortunately still do die over the coming days. So I think we just need to watch it. I'm Adam Wishart, a science writer. I'm going to my hometown, Birmingham, because it has one of the highest rates of premature birth in Britain. I want to find out if keeping these babies alive is medicine at its most pioneering and brilliant, or is it science pushing the limits of nature too far? It's a subject that many of the medical team themselves find deeply uncomfortable. I don't think I would want my baby at 23 weeks resuscitated. Why would that be? Because, I suppose because I know what, what it involves for the baby um, that, and the outcomes being so poor. It's, and it's not, I suppose it's not just the baby, it's the stress on the whole, the whole family, the emotional or upset that you, need, you go through. And, f and then the end result may be a child who's severely disabled and potentially has a very poor poor quality of life. Looking at it from a nursing point of view, if I had a baby that was 23 weeks and would I, would I want to go through everything? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm sure that looking at it, from, at it if I was the parent, I'd probably be like most parents here and want everything to be done because you, you'd be desperate to have a baby that's, that's healthy. Surprisingly, given that the treatment of 23-week babies is so pioneering, the decision to resuscitate isn't usually taken by doctors. Because of the massive odds against a good outcome, it's a choice that's given to the parents. Claire's in the 23rd week of pregnancy and her waters have just broken. Her doctors have tried to delay the birth, but it's now imminent. With her partner Paul, Claire's made the decision that their baby will be resuscitated. I spoke to the doctor from the new night this morning and I said that we'd rather than try and at least help and if they can't, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we know that they have tried. 
I can't see any reason not to try. If things don't pan out and the worst happens, at least we can turn around and say we tried. You know, we had the choice and we went for it. Yeah. Sorry. Claire needs a caesarean section because an infection threatens the health of both her and her child. But the unit's clinical director knows that only about half of all babies of this gestation survive the birth. It may be that because baby's so very early, we won't be able to resuscitate her. And if that happens, she won't survive more than um, 20 minutes or so. As the surgery gets underway, the resuscitation team are ready. It's important to do it really quickly because babies can change very suddenly. When you think about it, this baby has had a circulation going around in the way that it does in unborn babies until just now and hasn't needed to use her lungs at all until just now. So a lot of things will start changing really rapidly once she's out in the world can't maintain a steady temperature and has to rely on her own lungs and her own heart. This is what a 23-week baby looks like. Young enough to be aborted, but just old enough for there to be hope. Seeing this, I can't imagine that anybody could stand by and let her die. A tube is forced down her throat and air is pumped into her lungs. Her breathing is regular, her heart is beating, but many dangers lie ahead. Her ability to cope with an infection at this stage isn't very good. She doesn't have the immunity, she doesn't have the reserves that a bigger, stronger, more mature baby would have. So infections that do happen to these very small babies, they can be overwhelming. Once stabilized, the babies rush to intensive care she's already exceeding expectations. That's fine so far, isn't it? She's lovely. She's in really good condition at birth. Better, when she, better than we thought she might be. Um, wriggly, active, doesn't need much oxygen. Trying to breathe by herself. Got the ventilator helping her along. We've just got to get her up and into the room and under the monitors. Whereas most women who have just given birth would expect to cradle their baby, Claire must wait. Her daughter Holly weighs just a pound and a third. She's placed in the incubator. At 23 weeks, her lungs aren't fully developed, so a drug is pumped in to help them work. 20 years ago, this just wasn't possible. But now, if things go well, Holly will be here for four months until the time she would have been born. But then an alarm on one of the multitude of machines signals trouble. <laughs> the doctors try everything to keep Holly alive. They put a new breathing tube down her throat. They massage her heart. They pump her with adrenaline. but the signs are bleak.
baby's blood sample is really just not compatible with life. Um, Would you like us to get her out for the cuddle while she's still got the tube in and for the heart rate, or do you want us to take the tube out for her? Sorry, honey. <laughs> Would I please, please? We yeah. certainly can't. We'll just get her out for you, okay? We tried and we failed. And I don't think we failed because of anything that we did wrong. Um, but we were unsuccessful, we were un ultimately unsuccessful. And a baby has died. And that's really sad. I have to use my profession you know, to the best of my ability. You can't get, let emotion get into it, but sometimes it does. And you go to the cupboard and you have good crime, whatever it is. It does affect you, but it's something that you have to suppress. Could you just imagine if all nurses started blottering? You'd never get any work done. Every year in Britain, a few hundred babies are born in the 23rd week of pregnancy. Their treatment is costing the NHS more than £10 million a year. But with the health service strapped for cash, those that fund these procedures are beginning to question their cost effectiveness. If it was my child, and from all the information that I know, I would not resuscitate. I would not wish my own child to be resuscitated. And my view is, is that this, the, we're doing more harm than good by resuscitating 23 weekers. I can't think of very many interventions that have such poor outcomes when we're talking about resuscitating the very small babies. For me, the big issue is, is that we're spending an awful lot of money on treatments that have very marginal benefit. Um, and personally, I would prefer to free up that money to spend on providing um, support, care, um, to people who have much more lifelong chronic conditions and supporting their families. There is nothing in what I've seen over the last 20 years to suggest that I will be allowed to do that or people like me will be allowed to do that. The clamour is always for the, the high tech, the new drug, the new under drug, the new under treatment. So it makes it very difficult. The practice of resuscitating 23 week babies isn't universal. The Dutch have significantly fewer births in extreme prematurity, probably because of less poverty and fewer teenage mums, and they have a very clear position on babies born at 23 weeks. If a woman gives birth and she's in the 23rd week, yes. what do you do? The baby is born and is given compassionate and often care and given to the parents, and they nearly all die within a few minutes or hours. We, d we don't do anything. 23 weeks, none. The consequence of your policy is that you're letting a few die. Well, if you will, that's, that's, that's true, but then it is, that's the case. You know, you're effectively killing a, a, a tiny number of 23 babies that would have lived. 
I don't think we are killing them. It's it's just that is how nature works. Uh, sometimes there's no way you can help these babies. I think we are doing more harm to treat them and, and then after two or three hours or two or three days or six weeks the infant will die anyway having had a lot of suffering and pain and that doesn't do any and that doesn't have any purpose at all. The Dutch position seems hard-headed but they argue they want to concentrate resources on the most successful procedures. Throughout Europe, survival rates for premature babies born at 24 weeks and above have increased significantly over the last decade. But for those born in the 23rd week, the limit of nature may have been reached. Returning from Holland, I'm struggling with the question, is it fair on British babies that we subject them to so much traumatic intensive care? when their odds of survival are so tiny. Simone is now 10 days old. She might soon be able to breathe on her own and her eyelids are no longer fused. Her mother Kelly is 23 years old and has four other children. Her father Simon has five additional children with other mothers. And there might have been more. One reason why Simone is one of the most fragile babies on the unit is that she's the only survivor of triplets. This particular baby has been a complete surprise and a shock to this mum and this family. She only knew she was pregnant a couple of weeks before. She only knew she had triplets one week before and then she had the babies unexpectedly. So now she's got to deal with two children who have died and one who is alive but is having intensive care and could die. And how do you feel about being here, Kelly? It's horrible. Mm. It's horrible. You just don't want to be here. You have a bit of time with her. Not... Yeah, we've... We normally take them home. You don't sit here with them. It's weird. It's... I've got a lot, lot more fight in this today. Mm -hmm. Help me to always more. It's a lot more. Maybe a better lot. I'm still crying. Because you hope when you say that. It's a little fighter. It's, it's getting to me now, B. Really get into me. I've seen a lot. Of. You just think to yourself, you're supposed to be a dad. You're supposed to protect her. You know, daddy's supposed to be the hero, and your daddy's supposed to look after his little girls. And there's nothing you can do. The doctors are beginning to worry that Simone isn't developing as quickly as they might wish. The concern is that if she doesn't improve, then more treatment will only cause her pain rather than extend her life. But once again, key decisions about medical intervention fall on the parents' shoulders. The doctors need Kelly and Simon to agree that if Simone deteriorates any further, treatment should be withdrawn. I think that's a huge amount for anybody to cope with, um, let alone, you know, a young lady with, with other children to look after at the same time. Very, very difficult to deal with. And I'm sure she won't have taken in all the possibilities um, and the ramifications that might happen to this baby in future. wanting to say is that if she deteriorated and became really sick she'd still get the same treatment that she's getting 
now and we'd check that everything was still working. But what we wouldn't want to go ahead and do is, is lots of other interventions that would not be pleasant for her and probably wouldn't in the end do her any good and probably wouldn't work in any case. And that's something that we are often say in these very premature babies. It isn't that we want to turn the machine off. We obviously, we're, we're still actively giving her intensive care treatment at the moment. It's just if she were to deteriorate, yeah. how far we would go in trying to resuscitate her. I mean, it's how, how do you feel about that? Oh, I hate turning that machine off. No, just, I, if it, I, even if it come to it. No way. I'm not, I'm not mm. talking about turning the ventilator off in any way, shape or form. It's just, you know, we, we would go so far, but we wouldn't want to put her, you know, make her last hours unpleasant, as it were. Because the likelihood is if, it get, if she gets to that stage, that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be any benefit to her. But obviously we need you to, to decide how how you feel about that. I'm not sure if it's right to put this responsibility onto the parents. But the law constrains doctors from making critical decisions without the parents' consent, even if they're in the best interests of the baby. I think there'll ever be a point where, where you'd want the doctors to not try and help her? No. There'll never be a point like that. She'll go on, she'll go on to the end. No, I'll do everything they can. But never log, if there's a decision log, touch wood to turn the machine off. I could never do it. I'd never do it. But I would, if she's suffering, it would sound, it'd be bad not to do it. But what person would? I don't think anybody would turn the machine off. I know I couldn't do. I'll be out there. Because I'd feel to myself then, well, you've killed your own child. I couldn't live there. If I was a parent and so I knew what I knew now, I would say enough is enough. But you see, I can only speak for myself. I'm not as a child that has gone through what this little baby is going through. So I can't say, but from a medical background, I'd say, look, this is enough. My child's suffering, stop it. But from a parent's point of view, it's not been through the medical, has any medical background. It's very, very difficult. It's like killing your own child, you know? And when parents make a decision, they have to live with it for the rest of their lives. Weird. It goes a few days. It has good days and then it has bad days. It's horrible. So waiting for Christmas. It's one of them in waiting. Horrible. And then when you see her, you look at her and there's no. It, it looks normal. But there's nothing wrong. And it's kicking. It's moving. Wriggling about. Crying. It's weird. It's worked too hard. It's been two weeks. It's come too far to give up. So like you, if and us, not like everybody, you fought for something that much and you want it, you don't give up. So I ain't gonna give up for no one. I'll make sure of that one. Clinical decisions for these babies are some of the most complex in medicine. Risks so great, the technology so new, the recurring question, do these babies have human rights or should they be treated as fetuses, unviable at such an age? The Bible for doctors and parents facing these dilemmas was published by the Nuffield Council for Bioethics four years ago but the guidelines have limits because each of these patients is so different. Nobody can tell which baby is so underdeveloped 
that they have a fatal flaw in their gut, heart or brain, or which will struggle on. So the lives of these babies are ruled by heartbreaking uncertainty. This is Matilda, another 23-week baby. She was born four days ago, the survivor of twins, and weighs only a pound. Like many of these babies, her skin is thin and gelatinous, and bruises at the slightest touch. There's our baby there, and, and you haven't held her yet. Um, you haven't, you're expressing milk and there's not been able to feed her. It's just not normal. It doesn't feel real, does it? They sort of said to us, for the first week, it's, it's touch and go and we'll see how she responds. Um, and then each day we come in and they say, oh, she's been really stable and she's doing okay. And then you don't want to get your hopes up. And then every time you sit here and the alarms go off, you're like, and then it stops, and then it restabilizes. So. We just have to trust in what professionals are going to tell us about how much trauma, if any, Matilda has suffered, and and how we then go on to deal with it. Really, I just I just feel really a little bit like I want to try and pretend it's not happening. Craig and Lucy, both police officers, have a meeting with the doctor to discuss Matilda's prognosis. It would help me a lot if you could just tell me where you are based on what people have told you, what you understand Matilda's problems are and, and, and you know, where you're... We just appreciate that she's obviously very poorly. Yes. And each day, that if she's stable, does that give her a chance to get a bit stronger? Yeah. That, I think that's what we don't really understand, yes. is is she getting stronger yes. or is she just teetering along? Yes. And I think that's why we're nervous about giving you any, this is what we do or this is what we don't yes. want, because we don't really know what the impact yes. is of what you will or won't do. Yes. And I think that... We said earlier, didn't we, we're looking at like survival every day, mm. but is that the best option? Yes. It's never going to get better. Yes, yes, yeah. Now, I don't know how Matilda is going to be, but I think there is still some hope. Mm. I think the odds are stacked against her. Mm. And, you know, I think that we may be in for stormy times ahead. Uh, I don't think, and I don't think we're in a situation where it's clear that we can't help her anymore. Do you see what I mean? There still are options that we yeah. have. And that's not to say that we will keep going on and on and on. And what I don't want is to put her through suffering, discomfort, to get a, a baby at the end of the day who's alive at any cost. Yeah. That's not what we're here yeah. for. That's how we that's feel. That's something we said we don't want. If she was to go down the, mm. the deterioration side, then we appreciate that yeah. she else, she has so. to have a quality of life mm. yes. and yeah. like the chronic lung disease or yes. the lungs are not developed yes. yeah. then we'd, we'd probably go down the route of just let nature take yeah. its course if she were to deteriorate to such a point where we needed to do the the, res the cpr resuscitation yeah. and then then we wouldn't I institute that because right. it's you know it's it's not what you want, and it's 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 inappropriate mm. in the circumstances. If if mm. she's so poorly that she needs that yeah. degree of, you know, resuscitation, then it's not not meant to be. I think mm. I suspect things will become clearer yeah. as time goes yeah. on. It's a kind of partnership, you know. We're looking. We want what's best for her. We all do, and you know, obviously, we've got the expertise, and you've yeah. got. Uh, she's your she's your baby. all these babies, a constant concern is that even if they survive, they'll be permanently disabled. Even the life-saving treatments themselves increase the risk of disability. The plastic tubes for breathing can cause chronic lung disease. The drugs to accelerate development can cause cerebral palsy. And a medicine to heal the heart 
can cause the complete collapse of fragile guts. The consequence of any decision here may be felt for the rest of their lives. Catherine Rutherford is a nurse practitioner on the neonatal unit. So 23 week babies, if they survive, of which few will, the majority are going to be disabled in some way and quite severely. Her experience runs deeper than merely professional. Twenty-one years ago, her daughter Heather was born at what was then the very limit of viability, 26 weeks gestation. All I can use at my four, four limbs is my left arm. I'm not able to get myself anything to eat, anything to drink, get to the loo, answer the phone. Basically, if the carers don't come, I'm stuck in bed. As an adult, Heather has no routine help from the NHS. But the local authority provides carers to help her up in the morning. <laughs> Heather is struggling with her transition to adulthood after a happy school life and good A-level results. Earlier this year, she sank into depression. I had six months of counselling. I was crying every single night. I, I just didn't know where to turn, what to do. Horrible things were going through my head. So I just wished I could end my life, really. Is this as far as my life's going to go? You know, there's obviously nothing else out there for me, so... What's the point, really? Like other parents of very premature babies, Catherine made decisions at the beginning of Heather's life. They still prey on her mind. I don't think we've actually sat down and said, was it the right decision? Because I don't think any of us want to know <laughs> what the other person thinks. Because I think I would be devastated if she thought I'd made the wrong decision. The same as she would be devastated if she thought I'd made the wrong decision. I haven't got a clue who she is, so that doesn't matter. But I don't think at that point in time you have any understanding of what people are telling you because you just see a baby in front of you because suddenly you have a child, so you want that child to survive. The other thing that massively, massively, massively scares me is where my parents go. I'm so, so scared, because I rely on them so much. I really do. Mm. As each, each year goes by, I get more and more scared, to be honest. I'm, I don't look forward to growing up at all. I really don't. I hope nobody's made a conscious After Heather's birth, me. Catherine trained to become a nurse and chose to work on the neonatal unit. She's in a unique position to counsel parents. When you're advising a parent of a 23-week patient, what would you, what do you try and explain to them? Try and, ex try and explain what the problems are and what their outcomes are liable to be. And, but being a parent, you generally hear what you want to hear. So if somebody tells you the 5% chance and the 95% chance, you're going to cling to the 5% because somebody's told you that because that's what you want to hear. And I think that is generally what happens. The numbers are stark. Only 9 out of 123 weekers will survive hospital. Of those, 6 will be severely or moderately disabled. And only 1 will lead a fully able-bodied life. Of course, every parent hopes that their child will be that one in a hundred. Mike and Ursula have two daughters, one of whom was born in the 23rd week. This is a nappy which was really big. How big were you compared to that nappy? I don't know. 
probably like that. I got a, a phone call saying that the baby was being born. They were talking about saving the mother's life and the baby had no chance. This was way too big for me. And down expecting uh, to, to arrive to a, a, a dead baby. Again, this was way too big for me. She was only 23 weeks and her chances of survival were very tiny. We named her Molly that night. We hadn't, it was too early in the pregnancy. We hadn't really agreed a name, but she, we named her Molly and she survived the first night and carried on surviving by the skin of her teeth. It's just strange to think that it was me. So huge amounts of, of medical intervention early on. Obviously, I can't count the number of transfusions she had. Oh, oh well done. We had frequent setbacks where her, the potential for her quality of life to be pretty poor was, was great. Someone needs to go on the other. Good job. I can't imagine Stop making it. a decision at a delivery. What do we do? Because you just don't know. And nobody, nobody would say, you know, Molly shouldn't have been resuscitated. Nobody, obviously. But none of us knew how well she was going to be. She's full of life, full of beans, full of fun. Can be a monkey. Happy. Loves life. Molly's survival hasn't come without cost. Today she only has one kidney. Her epilepsy is controlled by drugs, and the lack of strength in one side of her body means she needs weekly physiotherapy. Her parents, who are both doctors, have invested considerable time and money in helping her lead a normal life. It costs, I suppose, the same as private physio would. It's £30 a session, and in that sense, it's worth every penny. And we're just lucky that we can afford it. Obviously, lots of people couldn't. But surely this is the kind of care that all surviving 23-weekers should be offered by the NHS. I think it would be a good thing to, to think about. Either. The NHS couldn't afford it as on a one-on-one -on -one basis, probably, but you could do classes. And you could show parents these sorts of exercises. Oh, as even the most active 23-weekers require support throughout their lives, how are we as a society looking after their needs? Dr Anne Orkitt is a paediatric consultant in Birmingham who cares for disabled children, including the survivors of premature birth. Is there anything else particularly that you're worried about that um, we need to discuss today? Uh, just like that, when she gets breathless, really, though, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that she is all right. Do I need to be using the inhaler more? Or? Well, it settles down quite quickly, quickly doesn't yeah. it? And that's really why I wanted to listen, because mm -hmm. she's not wheezy now. No. And are you able to give the care that these kids need? No, it's a very easy answer. Uh, there may have been increased investment in the NHS over the last few years, and a lot of that has gone into neonatal intensive care. Um, but there's been very little investment in community services for disabled children. The waits for things like early intervention physiotherapy, you would expect it to be, they could see a physio the next day. No, that, that isn't the case. I think as a society, we tend not to look at these lower profile things. It's very easy to say, oh, we need more monies to have more miracle babies surviving at 23 weeks. It, it grabs the public's imagination. Um, and probably also the, the NHS commissioner's imagination. Um, but if I go along and say, actually, I, I could do with another physiotherapist to provide a bit more support for children with mild forms of cerebral palsy, that doesn't sound very sexy. Uh, and that doesn't get the money in the same way. Yeah, so I, I think the priorities are the wrong way around. Heather suffers from the effects of these priorities. Since turning 18, she no longer receives the plethora of NHS services that were provided to her as a child. As you get older, your disability affects you a hell of a lot more. A hell of a lot more. 
how can you go from doctors to social workers to physiotherapists to uh, consultants to absolutely nothing? I, I just don't understand it. Now I think it's very selfish to keep the baby alive and say, oh yes, we've done our bit for society, that baby's alive and it's going to have a wonderful life. Well, that's not always true, you know. That baby could think, oh, I'm alive, but what do I do now? What, what, what's my purpose now, <laughs> you know? Oh, we kept you alive, but now you cost us too much money, so we're not going to bother. I'm sorry, but if you're willing to support someone at the, at the beginning of life, you, you should be willing to support them till the end. Matilda is now 28 days old. She's struggling because a tube in her heart, which would normally close at full-term birth, has remained open. Craig and Lucy must now decide whether their tiny baby should undergo heart surgery. I can't really get my head around how they've managed to keep her alive. And so I suppose that proves really, in a way, that, that babies can survive that tiny. And I don't know really that she's given her a bit, and so you know, do we, sh you know, do we give her a bit back for what she's given us, really? We need to make a cut on the side, and we actually go between the rib spaces, right, okay. okay? And it'll be on the left-hand side, and that lets us get into where the, the lungs are. Right. We have to move the lung forward, yeah. okay? And then we can get down to where the duct is. Yeah. Any questions about that so far? No. Okay. Now there is a risk, mm -hmm. okay, and there is a risk of not surviving an operation like this. Yeah, yeah I think well, we well, know that. Yeah, well, <laughs> we've gone along yeah. with, throughout the whole sort of four weeks, so we're aware of what yeah. risks it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if the other person wants to, they could always sign that space okay. there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. All right. When we were signing that consent form, just it said reasons for surgery and it just said life saving. The way that they've put it to us is if this works, then everything else can, can cascade with this. So it can be a case of all her problems could all improve. Mm. as a result of this duct, yeah. so we keep fingers crossed. <laughs> Kelly and Simon have been called to the hospital. 18 days after her birth, Simone's heart has suddenly stopped. Um, all parents are on their way. She still feels warm. Um, but I don't know how long she'll stay like this. It's been going on uh, a bit 18 minutes now. Um, which is generally not a good sign uh, once you've gone more than 10 minutes. Now. I think we should stop. I think we should stop. 20 minutes and as I'm sweating like that, it's a short time like that. Is Given the circumstances with this baby, it's appropriate now to just stop resuscitating after 20 minutes. We can't just keep a heart rate going for this length of time without without a good reason. I feel like we've, to be honest, got this baby further along than I ever would have anticipated given her circumstances. After weeks of treatment, Simone becomes one of the overwhelming majority of these babies who don't go home. 
I think the outcomes for babies at 23 weeks are not changing dramatically. And I think this does reflect the fact that you're near a biological limit of what you can do. Um, so there isn't a steady increase in the proportion who survive. There was a study which showed that although the overall survival rates have not improved, so they still die, but we're keeping them alive longer before they die. They just have a longer period to be endured, if you like, I think that was the word in the paper. They endure a longer period before they die. So you spend all that money on intensive care for six weeks and then the baby doesn't survive anyway. Wow. So that, that doesn't seem a good use of public money, really. As we spend more and more money in intensive care, it's outside the hospital where the real problem lies. You're much more likely to give birth to a child in extreme prematurity if you live in poverty. The more prosperous the part of the country, the lower the rate of prematurity in the babies born. You have to look around the neonatal unit, don't you? And you can see that it is the more disadvantaged families that end up the majority. We know that we have more premature babies than other countries in Western Europe whose financial circumstances are not particularly better than ours. That's where we need to put our money. In preventing in preventing premature birth, if we possibly can, yes. Matilda has survived her operation and now stands a very good chance of going home. If she does well and gets a bit stronger, we're kind of three months in, but so you've got to be in it for the long haul, really. All we're doing here is just um, giving Matilda a little sort of bath, really, just doing the cares for cleaning her mouth and giving her a dab down, changing a nappy. Each arm and leg has got um, a tube of some kind or a splint or so trying to to clean it. There's not much to clean. The difficulty is for us now, if they say to us Right, we've had a, a head scan on Matilda today and it's what they call catastrophic, which is, you know, she's brain dead or there's lots of damage to her brain. Matilda is strong enough really to survive on her own without the help of anybody. So really that is putting us in a position, sounds a bit harsh to say that, but, but we are now in a position where Matilda was with us for the long run, really. And before, when she was very, very poorly, if they'd told us then that there'd been some really bad brain damage, I suppose we would have been in a position where we could have sat down and said, do you want to continue keeping her alive? And we don't have that option anymore. Can you lift your legs up? That's a big one, Matilda. Well, she's done the huge poo for her, but I'm, I'm getting through. <laughs> Should we clean your bum one last time? Yeah. I know you don't like it, but you've got to clean it. Okay, okay? Good girl. If you get your hopes up too much, you'll end up just getting knocked down, so you'd rather just keep it, keep it level. Um, and then, yeah, good news is good news, but don't get too excited because things can change. And she's just, she's at the stage where she's doing her best, and that's all you can wish for, really. It's fantastic to see Matilda doing so well. But in the six months I spent on the ward, she's the only 23-weeker I've seen survive. And that means that much of the treatment provided to these babies 
by the highly skilled and dedicated doctors and nurses has been in vain. It's 139 days after Matilda's birth. So she's coming home today in about an hour. Um, and fingers crossed, we won't have to spend very much more time in hospital. Although, who knows? We've already been warned that she might have to sort of come back in if she picks up a cold or, or anything like that. So we are prepared for coming back into hospital. She'll be five months old tomorrow, her actual birth date. She will be four weeks old from her due date tomorrow. So it is a little bit like we've just had a baby. She's seven pounds today. So she's gone from one pound one born to seven pounds in five months. So yeah, she's come a long way in five months. It'll be a while before they discover whether Matilda's prematurity has lasting consequences. We're very conscious of how she's moving because we know that she's had brain damage on one side of her brain. She's had it on her right side. So we know that possibly her left side may be affected. And it's interesting that her left ear isn't picking up anything. So we're wondering whether that might be a problem. I don't know. She's going to be referred and we'll see whether or not that remains a problem. It might be that it's just a temporary problem with her hearing. I spoke to a physiotherapist this morning, actually, who said it's not really until they're two that you can really start to judge whether things are right or not. So, you know, we've got a, at least another 18 months to sort of get through and, you know, hopefully she'll be OK. What's happened has happened now and we will have to deal with it, you know, and we will. I'm sorry, puppy. on the back, head, back of her head okay. She's a lot bigger now, so her breathing is getting better. We know her breathing's getting better because she's on so much less oxygen than when she first sort of started out. Um, she's going to be on an apnea monitor anyway when she's at home, so that's sort of... Um, it's basically a little pad on her stomach which um, monitors her breathing. And if she were to stop breathing, her stomach was to stop moving, um, it would alarm. So we've got a bit of backup that if she's at home asleep at night and, and that goes off then, then we know because I think you, you do instinctively know if something's wrong but I suppose you can't always be there and be awake to see it. Craig and I keep saying we'll be sat there doing breathing watch. <laughs> Whose turn is it to, to check if she's still breathing? I know it sounds terrible but you feel a bit panicky like that because she's come so far and you think I don't want her to go home and then you know have a real, you know, a turn the minute she's at home because, you know, you're not, there's not somebody there 24-7 watching. Matilda's survival <clears throat> is due partly to being born healthier than others. She also demonstrates the brilliance of more than a hundred thousand pounds worth of modern medicine. But is it right to treat babies like Matilda? It's a question that divides many doctors and parents. Well, I think we should change in terms of looking at what we do in that very early 23-week gestation period and have a hard look at the outcome from that group and make a decision on that. Just as the same way that we've made hard decisions around things like cancer drugs and saying the outcomes are not good enough to use that, therefore we won't spend that money. I certainly feel that with the financial situation it is, you just can't go on giving people necessarily what they want. The other thing is what does the baby want? And there's a lot of emphasis put on the parents and the parents' views and what they want. Um, but somewhere in there there needs to be an advocate for the baby. I mean, can you go this distance? Not to save life in case some of them are disabled is, is a political statement of, of a euthanasia that it isn't really acceptable in, our, in the general mores of our society. We have been, we're not keen to put people to uh, sleep just because they're, they're disabled, which is essentially what you're doing. So I'm not saying that every effort should be made for every child once futility has been reached. I'm saying really that the, the, the sort of 23-year-old, someone like Molly, should be given every chance. <laughs> <laughs>
What is the worst? That somebody can't speak, that somebody can't walk, that somebody can't see? I feel frustrated because I think that's so unfair if that does happen to her, you know. But it does happen to people and why should it, you know, be any more unfair for us than it should be for anyone else that's got, you know, babies that have got these problems and children that have got these problems and adults that have got these problems. Sometimes I think to myself, don't be ungrateful because some people don't even have that, you know, some people don't take their babies home. First time out, really. Yeah. She don't look to be that bothered about it. <laughs> no. She's like, whatever. Matilda is a miracle, and nobody's suggesting that she shouldn't be with us today. But I do think we need to make some tough choices. The first priority for the NHS should be prevention. We could avoid so much of this suffering if we could reduce our premature birth rate to that of other European countries. Next, we should shift the balance for these decisions back onto doctors, away from the stricken parents. And we must provide lifelong care to those premature babies who survive but with disabilities. Ultimately, though, I would understand if the NHS adopted the Dutch position and stopped saving 23 liters. Certainly, I think resuscitation should be the exception rather than the rule. Not resuscitating at birth is, in my opinion, not the same as killing. Because it's only intensive medical intervention that's keeping these babies alive. But I realise such a shift in policy would make many people deeply uncomfortable. I would say it's unique in terms of no-going area. I mean, like, totally no-going area. I mean, if I came out and said, you know, I'm going to stop resuscitating babies at 24, below 24 weeks, there would be a witch hunt. Okay. Mama, Mama, do you want to go in the car? We're going to go home now. Guess what? No, we're not home. We're in the car on the way home. I know. She's holding my hand. <laughs> oh, no. Don't cry. <laughs> no, she's fast asleep. She hasn't woke up for about three hours. She's slept through the whole thing.